Ingmar Bergman. Ingmar Bergman. 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 Ingmar Bergman. It's always said that Ingmar Bergman understands women. Would you say that's true? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Ingmar Bergman is one of the most gifted filmmakers of the 20th century, and although he has become somewhat of an unknown to modern American audiences, is responsible for influencing some of the medium's biggest names. For the uninitiated, watching one of his films can sometimes be a bit arduous, akin to, as one of my former professors claimed, watching paint dry. Yet, whenever I watch one of his pictures, I'm filled with a burning passion for film, art, and life itself. So, in an attempt to honor his legacy and impact on my own life, I've decided to revisit one of his so-called lesser works, a film that has haunted me since I first watched it nearly 10 years ago, Hour of the Wolf. Hour of the Wolf was released in 1968, just two years after one of Bergman's most renowned films, Persona, and like its predecessor, contains a lot of the same striking visual imagery that, while not the defining characteristic of his work, is nevertheless indispensable to its effectiveness. In fact, some of the strongest impressions left by this film have more to do with its haunting shots than its dialogue. Particularly appalling is Johann's murder of a young child, the violence of which is shocking enough to linger in the mind long after the film ends. Even a decade later, and with no visual aid, I was able to recall this scene vividly. Johann's anxiety as a child momentarily resurfaces as clear in my mind as the scenes of a film I watched just last week. Yet for all its effectiveness, there are several other scenes littered throughout the film that one could easily point to as standout moments. Like the climactic castle scene with a supposedly lifeless Vogler, or Erlen Josephson's eerie wall claim as the Baron which originated as an actual nightmare of Bergman and served as one of the earliest inspirations for the film. <laughs> In many ways, rather than simply being a failed follow-up to Persona, these terrifying images underline just why Hour of the Wolf is a quintessential Bergman film. A lot of how Bergman approached film was in fact shaped by his intensely personal relationship with images, both conscious and unconscious. In his essay, Film Has Nothing to Do with Literature, Bergman described his conception of a film as beginning with, quote, something vague. It can be a few bars of music, a shaft of light across the street. These are split-second impressions that disappear as quickly as they come, yet leave behind a mood like pleasant dreams. It is a mental state, not an actual story, but one abounding in fertile assumptions and images. With this in mind, one should view any of Bergman's original concepts as simple expressions of his most inward emotions and natural artistic sensibilities, which is to say that any of his completed films are actualized versions of whatever his mental state is during the time of writing and production. To suggest that Bergman's films are intensely personal is in no way of groundbreaking, of course. However, it is important to consider when examining his films. All of his most influential works, while Strawberries, Through a Glass Darkly, Persona, Cries and Whispers, Fanny and Alexander, among others, display some degree of personal intimacy with the subject, and many of them were written during times of duress for the filmmaker. Furthermore, while Bergman's filmography is very expansive, and he was never shy about delving into many a difficult topic, he often covered familiar territory in these films, meaning you can generally expect to see one of these three themes. Identity, isolation, or regret. Although it is admittedly quite different when compared with these other films, Hour of the Wolf is perfectly direct about its efforts to tackle these same concepts. In this case, it is identity and isolation which factor most heavily in the narrative. Throughout the film, Johan is struggling to understand who he really is. The seemingly peaceful domestic life established in the early moments belie his lingering fantasies about former lover Veronica and the deeply troubling images that haunt him at night. While the nightmarish images are what edge this film toward horror, it is the conflict of the competing romantic desires that largely drives Johann's development. And ultimately, this inability to command his own life is what proves to be Johann's downfall, the humiliation he experiences as a result of this feebleness actually proving to be one of the most unsettling moments of the film. <laughs> <laughs> Yet Johann's troubles do not exist in a vacuum, and Bergman is keen to convey the degree to which the setting affects his outlook both positively and negatively. In those early moments, the serene qualities of the island seemingly offer Johan and Alma an escape from outside troubles. But as time passes, their isolation becomes a cage in which Johan is left to fight against his own tormented mind. And it is this torment which the other residents of the island eventually start exploiting to great effect. 
Even as the couple's life becomes more frequently intruded upon, a pattern that, on the surface, would seem to disrupt any sense of isolation, Johan retreats further into his own mind, and we soon realize that it is Johan's fear of others, which Alma notes at the beginning, that pulls him away from his true self. As psychiatrist Barbara Young put it, Hour of the Wolf, much like Persona, is about, quote, the disintegration of a personality. But while it's rather easy to look at those examples and differentiate Hour of the Wolf by its tone, it would be a disservice to view it as genre experimentation cloaked in Bergman's cinematic language. As Ingmar once stated, Hour of the Wolf is seen by some as a regression after Persona. It isn't that simple. Persona was a breakthrough, a success that gave me the courage to keep on searching along unknown paths. When I see it today, I understand that it is about a deep-seated division within me, both hidden and carefully monitored, visible in both my earlier and later work. Hour of the Wolf is important since it is an attempt to encircle a hard-to-locate set of problems and get inside them. To Bergman, Hour of the Wolf was the culmination of his work on Persona, rather than a retreat from it. And yet years later, the film, while more respected now than upon its release, still fails to generate the type of enthusiasm as its predecessor. Now, by all accounts, Persona is the better film of the two, a landmark masterpiece of cinema whose tendrils reach farther than many seem to realize. However, as a Bergman devotee, I can't help but feel saddened that the two are not presented as a double feature. Bergman himself initially conceived of the films as such, having completed an earlier script titled The Cannibals that was meant to be what he dubbed a double film, lasting four hours. At 88 minutes, Hour of the Wolf isn't among Bergman's shorter films, and is in fact four minutes longer than Persona. However, longtime collaborator Sven Nikas ensures that the more probing and elongated sequences of the film do not drag down the overall pace. And this is one of my favorite aspects of the film in general. In contrast to certain criticisms of Bergman, Hour of the Wolf does not drag. Instead, it pushes ever forward in search of answers. But, like most of his work, the answers never fully come. While Persona was noted as having vampiric undertones, Hour of the Wolf is much less subtle. The devious actions of the film's strange supernatural figures are very much real within the context of the film and yet they still seem to speak towards some broader view of humanity, or perhaps society. Some have suggested that Bergman's difficult and sometimes traumatic childhood is perhaps the key to understanding this symbolism, and the filmmaker's extensive work on the subject does lend a lot of credence to this notion. But irregardless of interpretation, the overall sentiment I gather from the film is that the darkest nightmares come from within. And when you look at Alma's character specifically, that notion does seem to hold up. The film concludes with her breaking the fourth wall for a second time, openly considering how she became like Johan over the years, and questioning whether this change is what made her able to see the so-called ghosts. Additionally, Bergman, in describing the title, noted that it was the hour when the sleepless are haunted by their worst anguish, and was also reported as having said that completing the film freed him from his own Hour of the Wolf. Whether you subscribe to this theory or not, however, it's clear that Hour of the Wolf, just like any of Bergman's other great films, has a lot to say and rather than be swallowed up by the legacy of Persona, I truly believe it should be upheld as one of his finer works. At this point, I've seen nearly 20 films from Bergman, from his most renowned to his more obscure, yet Hour of the Wolf stands out as having provided some of the most lasting imagery of his entire career. The fact that it's taken time for people to properly appreciate it is a travesty, but fortunately the Criterion Collection did include the film in their beautiful 39 film box set of the filmmaker, and I think that's a great step towards recognizing its place in his filmography. Admittedly, it's not the first one I recommend for newcomers to Bergman, nor is it absolutely essential. But if you're looking for thoughtful, engaging cinema with a flair for the macabre, look no further. Hour of the Wolf is pure brilliance. <laughs>